Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, Health Junkies, on this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm chatting with Amy K. Wilson again, and we're going over a lot of the things that we found that we need to talk about. Now, here's the thing. We go over a lot of subjects in this podcast, but one of the biggest things I want you to be thinking about during this podcast is self-advocating because the Truth and Labeling Act, let's be real, there is 20% error allowed one way or the other on processed foods. What the heck? I mean, how can a person really truly know what they're eating when they're eating processed foods if the labeling is wonky like this? It's just not fair. So that's a biggie. And then the other big thing, one of the like, let's put it this, like tools you can have in your toolbox if you're taking medications is having a friend who's a pharmacist or getting to know your local pharmacist. Pharmacists are amazing for the knowledge that they have. Not only that, they hear from patients side effects. They hear what possibly other doctors aren't hearing about medications and things of that nature. They know more about the medications than us doctors do. That is why they are a crucial tool for us. So Amy being the combination of a nutritionist and a pharmacist, ooh, game changer there. So we go into things like the labeling. We go into if you're on meds and you're starting to lose weight, what do you wanna be looking for. We talk about labs. We talk about so many things in this podcast. You guys are going to love it. So get ready, jump in. Let's reintroduce you to Amy K. Wilson. Hey, health junkies. I brought Amy K. Wilson back on because we had just such a great conversation last time. And like, we, we may be becoming BFFs seriously, but really we just want to share stuff with you guys. Like there are so many things we talked about and I'm like, oh, yeah, what about that? And, and she was like, yeah. So anyway, She's back on. We're talking labs. We're talking what we see in pharmaceutical items. And and we're talking all things health and weight and things that could be in the way from weight. And gosh, just sit down and relax. This is going to be a good one. So Amy, welcome back to the Health Fix podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I am really stoked to be here. So yeah, grab your cup of coffee because it's going to be like two girlfriends just having a really good kind of conversation and diving into some things that I think need to be dived into. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And and probably the first one is this whole concept of of labs and what labs to run because a lot of people will will come to me and go, "Doc, my doc won't run my labs cuz they told me my hormones are too unstable during the month." So, <laughs> I I won't get an accurate idea of what's going on and I'm like, oh. And then the same thing about I can't run food sensitivity because it's not going to be accurate and I'm not going to run this. Do you hear that often from your folks? Oh my gosh. So what I can't stand is somebody saying, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Why should I run labs? And I understand, I think the pushbacks, the insurance company, the insurance company wants that ICD-10 code that says why, but you don't know what's going on or what your baseline is. Like when I started going through perimenopause, my practitioner was like, we are getting your labs now because I need to know what your baseline is. I need to know where you're starting from, what's going on so that we can start following along to see when you are tanking, when we need to possibly, if, you know, at that time, yes, uh, I will tell you guys right now, I'm on bioidenticals. That was a choice that I made. Um, We need to figure out what's going on and what's the best way to treat if you want to be treated. And I'm like, yeah. And it's the same way when someone says, well, and I'm fighting with one of my practitioners right now, not the one who I go to, but she wants me to get a dex scan for bone density bone density they won't do it until i'm 65 and we're both like but by 65 you probably have osteoporosis uh, so you should be testing it when you hit 45 50 because we want to see if there's osteopenia or anything else not when you get a fracture and say oh yeah now you now you qualify and it's the same thing with vitamin d b12s all yeah, you know we can get into the whole TSH, not just TSH, T three, T four. Let's have the whole kind of thing. And then when you're talking about cholesterol, okay, what it, what does everybody do? They do total cholesterol. All right, you're over two hundred. Let's put you on a statin. Hold one minute. Okay, my HDL is crazy through the roof. That comes from my mom's side. 
But also my LDL is a little bit on the higher side. And if you, I went to the minute clinic, um, you know, one of those little, those little clinics, cause yeah. I had to do something and they, they're like, your cholesterol is high. Should we do something? I'm like, wait, 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 let me show you my test where we actually looked at all the LDL and I have the fluffy kind, by the way, the fluffy kind's good. And there is, it's, it's, we have everything in pigeonhole. HDL is good. LDL is bad. And so therefore, if your LDL is higher and you're over 200, we put you on a stat instead of looking at the whole entire kit caboodle, because if you look at my ratio, my ratio is nothing. If you look at my triglycerides, they're in the fifties. So at, it's, it's looking at labs, but it's also understanding labs. And then also, you know, I bet you see all the time is like somebody comes in and they're like, oh, well, my doctor says that my T3, T4 and TSH are all in normal levels, but they're not normal. They're in normal lab levels. And every lab, by the way, your lab's different. And my labs in Kentucky are totally different than what yours are where you practice. And, and I know you do virtual, so their labs are different everywhere across the country. Mm-hmm those, those normal or those ranges are averages. Yeah. They're not, they're not per se. And one of the things that we've always been told is treat the patient, not the lab. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that, where that disconnect, where that comes from, that we stop doing that because if somebody is having hypothyroid issues and we're seeing all the clear case symptoms but their numbers are on the kind of higher end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. but they're fine. They're fine, mm -hmm. but maybe they're not. It's, it's crazy. It's, 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 yeah, it's crazy. I, mean, I went on a tangent there. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's huge because, you know, people will be like, oh, my doc checked my thyroid and told me it was okay. And I was like, oh, well, let me see your labs. And it's TSH. That's all they've done. Right. And I'm like, well, we have no idea what just TSH, TSH, that's brain to thyroid. What about the, what is your thyroid output? What's the uptake on the cells? I don't know. Do you have antibodies? No. You know, these are important things to know. But what's interesting, like you mentioned is, is, is the ranges because I've seen people at a TSH of six, like around six, and they have no thyroid symptoms. They are fine in the fine. department, right? Yeah. And so, but if the, if you come up in the conventional world, you're like, there's your thyroid med. And then they're like, I feel like crap. So I've had people that have been on both sides of that where they've been given yeah. a thyroid med, but no symptoms. And then they're like, now I feel like crap. Yeah. Um, and then of course, this is the biggest conundrum. There's like all the thyroid symptoms showing up and they maybe are low, borderline low, like maybe their T4 is like at 0.77, which for some labs is low, other labs not low. It's high, it's high. Yeah, it's, it's right oh, there. Like, oh my God. So it's like, where where do we stand in this this realm? You know, how, how do we navigate this with folks? It's almost like, like you said, we have to go to old school medicine and look at the patient, yeah. not the labs. Well, and vitamin D is another good example. We, yes. we say that normal is 30. So if you look at it lab, we say normal is 30. We're thinking normal is around 60 something is what, what we're thinking that normal is. And the, and, but it depends on who you talk to, depends on who, what study came out, depending on what, I guess, what podcast you listen to today. Exactly. <laughs> you know, cause you know, let, let's, let's talk about the hot topics, melatonin, vitamin D. I mean, a lot of those are, are hot topics, omega-3s, probiotics. Um, and it depends on who you talk to and what their theory is. But we do know that our body needs vitamin D. It's another hormone. It absolutely does. We know that it has something to possibly do with memory. We know that we see increased falls in people with lower vitamin D. When COVID was out, there was a study that came that showed that other um, comorbidities was having low vitamin D in the elderly population, that those residents in the nursing homes with lower vitamin D had poor outcomes with COVID. You know, were the studies a little bit iffy? Some of them were, but one of the things that vitamin D does is that it does help you feel better. It is a hormone. It helps your bones. There's a lot of things that we don't understand about vitamin D yet, which is I think cool in the same, because there's a lot, there's, I think there's a lot of things coming out about vitamin D. Can you overdose? Yeah, there's possibility, but that's a lot of vitamin D. But what I do know is that most people, especially in the United States, do not get enough vitamin D from the sunshine. 
Yeah. Good luck on that one. And even if you live in Texas, you are probably still not getting enough vitamin D because of the amount of time that you need to be in the sun. A lot of us don't convert vitamin D2 to D3. By the way, that's what comes in the sun is D2 and then converts to D3. I am one of those people who does not convert at all. And then I also don't have the receptors <laughs> to that get saturated. And then my transport system sucks. So here's what happens with vitamin D. If you guys, it's I, I like this analogy. So you take in vitamin D to D3, and then your bus comes to pick up your little vitamin D kids. Well, guess what? My bus doesn't have that many seats, so it can't pick up that many vitamin D. Then it takes it to the receptors. Mm -hmm. Well, my kids get off the bus and play hooky. They don't even get on the receptors. So the amount of vitamin D that I get is not much. So I have to take daily vitamin D in order to get the kids on the bus and get them to school without playing hooky. Other people are different. Some people have the transport system, the receptors, and are able to convert the D2 to D3. And so you might be good with taking once a week. So you may have your friend going, but I only take it once a month. And know that everybody's different because we used to say, oh, well, vitamins D is fat soluble, so it stays in your system forever. Well, we now know that's kind of wrong because, yes, it is fat soluble, but it all depends on your receptors and your transport system, which is crazy. We never knew that before. And it has to do with your genetics, believe it or not. Absolutely. I mean, I'm blown away when I do like the DNA company tests on folks and I see like their different DNA, you know, mutations with receptors, carriers, mm -hmm. you know, absorption. It's wild. A lot of people are, are mutated. Let's put it that way on all of them. And I'm like, dang, no wonder we have depression is seasonal affective disorder stuff. Right. So no wonder we have MS, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. And no wonder we have some hormone imbalances because I, you know, talking about that 30 being the level, you know, I, I've argued with patients before. They're like, well, my labs say they're normal. I'm like, oh my gosh, what would life be like if I could just get you to feel a little bit better? Let's, let's try a little bit on the vitamin D and like, yes, 50 to 60. I do see like a lot of people feel good in that range. Mm -hmm. Some people like, and, and my personal opinion is I, I don't have like a set, like, this is where you need to get if you're not at that target, you know, oh my gosh. I, I want people to get to a point with vitamin D that they feel good. And yeah. so many people, that is the one thing. And you've probably seen this too. Like they get their vitamin D up to where their body's happy and like mood's good. All of a sudden the hormones fall in place and you're like, that's it. It was really that easy all this time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and something that some people don't think about. So if you think about vitamin D is also with the circadian rhythm. So if we go Technically, if we go outside and we actually get our vitamin D, then when we get vitamin D is during daylight hours. Yes. And so if you're having problems sleeping, what time are you taking your vitamin D? Because if you're taking it in the evening, it's very possible that's messing up with your circadian rhythm. Try moving it to morning, mid-morning and see if that helps. Because that's the time when our body is naturally supposed to be producing that hormone. And it's just kind of, you know, we were talking about biohacking before. So it's like these little biohackers, you know, that, that you can make slight adjustments and feel better. Like I didn't know with B12 that cyanocobalamin, the way I methylate, not a good thing. And that was from doing a DNA test. And I have to take the sublingual because my gut doesn't absorb it right. And I have to do the adenosyl because I can't do the methyl because then I over methylate. And I was trying to figure out why B12 was not giving me energy. Like everyone's like, oh, B12 is amazing. And all these drinks have B12. And every time I, you know, every time I'd have them, I would feel horrible. I would actually feel kind of brain fogged. Well, it's because of the over methylation for me. And we think of things like, oh, I must need an energy drink or I need this and not realizing like, that some of the things that these people put in may not be good for you. And kind of start asking questions. If you're, you know, like, Hey, this energy drink does not make me feel good. There might be some reason that there might be some vitamins and minerals that you just are not in sync with. This is a huge point, especially methylation. Cause I mean, yeah. methylation. So those of you guys who are listening, you're like methyl, what? Um, <laughs> methylation is how we detox. 
it simplified. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not simplified. It's a very complex pathway of, of intricacy. It takes up a whole page of circles and things that are going in different directions. But it it really, if we boil it down, it's it has a lot to do with how we clear out ourselves from, from chemicals, but also like our mood, also our cholesterol, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And I do find methylation being one of those things that I kind of got annoyed by it when it really came out. I don't know if this happened to you. I was like, it's not the answer to everything. I think that's what happens, right? Something new comes out and it's the answer to everything. And I got annoyed by it and started to like kind of just brush it, it out yeah. <laughs> a little bit. And then now it's kind of gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, every we have more chemicals we're getting exposed to every day. People are, are really mm -hmm. struggling in this department. Now, because you are working so much in the weight loss realm, I bet you've seen different folks, you know, who've had weight loss hangups related to methylation. I have because it all depends on how quickly they get rid of toxins. And yeah, you know, what we hopefully, hopefully what the, the all good thing that you want is that the crap comes in and the crap comes out at the same rate. Mm -hmm. That's probably maybe 25% of the population. Mm -hmm. More than likely, there's a couple different things. One it comes in very fast and leaves very slow. And, you know, we'll see that with people who don't lose as quickly or are more, um, have more side effects with had diet drugs or had other things that they were trying to use quick fixes and couldn't understand why they felt so bad. That's, you know, toxins, I honestly believe it's toxins. Mm -hmm. And then you have those people who are kind of lucky. It's like, you know, oh, it comes in and it goes out really, really fast. So yeah, I think sometimes methylation is a hang up. It all comes down to, like I said before, on our other podcast, it really comes down to whole foods, eating right, getting rid of the toxins, getting rid of the ultra processed foods. Um, it drives me nuts. I'm on this kind of like Facebook group with, mm -hmm. with, trainers and people who are supposedly, and, and everything, oh, it's just calories in. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're having sugar-free, it doesn't matter if you're eating two nutri-grain bars, like the, the example is like, this person was eating two nutri-grain bars at breakfast. They had pizza and salad for lunch. And then dinner was something that they were picking up like Subway mm -hmm. and they were under, here's, here's the kicker. They were under 1300 calories, which was under what they should be eating according to this person, but they weren't seeing any results and they were actually gaining weight. So their, their, their assumption was, well, they must be cheating. They must not be following. They must be mm -hmm. eating other things because the pictures that they're showing me, they are under what they should be eating. So therefore they should be losing weight. And I wanted to scream because it's about quality of food. And if you have not watched the blue zone on Netflix, it's a, um, it's a documentary series. It just puts everything that i say over and over again. These people are not on meds. They're living to over a hundred. They're thriving to be over a hundred. And it all has to do with eating real foods, fruits and vegetables and, and moving their body. So they're giving their body the right thing, no matter how slow their methylation is in the first place, getting back to methylation yeah. or, or how fast it is, but they're giving their body everything it really needs to, to exist and exist happily that their, their system's able to keep up with all the toxicity because they're giving it, they're, they're actually giving it minimal toxicity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing that like, I, I want to really highlight with a lot of folks is that you don't have to be taking copious amounts of the B12s and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and folates and all these things that like, we once thought when we first started the whole methylation, like discovery, it was like, take five, you know, you need five grams or, you know, I I'm exaggerating guys, please don't do this. Um, <laughs> get your folic acid, get your B12 right. and make sure you're doing, you know, and, and you know, oh, cool. moment here and once you know, go ahead and get the injections. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'll still see that a lot of times. Oh, I, absolutely. I bet people come to you and, and they've seen like a naturopath or, or functional medicine doc and, and, uh, you know, the doc's done their training 
And no, no disrespect to the docs. I mean, I've done this too. I've, I've overmethylated people to the point where they're having tingling in their arms and legs. Mm, <laughs> yeah. Doc, I have lots of energy, but I am not feeling, I don't yeah. feel so great. I'm tingly. You know, it's like, oh crap, you know? And it's like, if we could get the foundation of food down, we don't need to supplement the daylights out of you. And, and all the it's going to the extreme. It's like, I had someone reach out to me. It's like, well, what do you think about colonics? Aren't those supposed to be good for you? I'm like, no, unless you're doing like a colonoscopy for some reason, go ahead. But on a regular basis to have your colon cleansed, we have bacteria on purpose. We need bacteria. And if you keep wiping out that bacteria, because what they were telling me was that they were told that things get absorbed better by cleaning everything out. Oh, I'm like, oh, you're taking off like the old poop that stays in there for years. Did you yeah. get that story? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, take a really good probiotic. And I'm like, I'll recommend one that's not cheap, but it's really good. And use that and eat some fiber because fiber is your intestines dishwasher. And quit Quit getting rid of all the good bacteria that your body needs that we now know that your gut microbiome is attached to your brain. That's how you absorb all your B12s and everything else in your stomach and have your methylation system go well is to have all that good bacteria. So by doing a colonic and they're thinking they're going to lose weight this way. And I'm like, you are setting yourself up for disease later on. You really are. And you're never going to find balance because you're not letting your body go to homostasis. You're not letting it get balanced. You're constantly taking out the good stuff. When you think you're taking out the bad stuff, you're taking out the good stuff and you're never going to find that balance and the whole, I guess the holistic approach, I guess they think they're doing a holistic approach, but to me, that's just extreme. You know, I mean, colonics, I've seen them beneficial when someone's super backed up and we really need to like get the balls moving. But when we're doing it just for weight loss, this is where no, I, this is not somebody them. having a blockage and needs to, you know, they, they're going to, there's going to be some issues if, or perforation if they don't get it. But yeah, this is for pure weight loss. Yeah. It's, it's not my, my jam. And I, I have heard different stories. Like I was saying, like the lot of people will talk, the, the hydrotherapists, sometimes they'll talk about, they're going to scale the, the old poop and or stool, basically that's stuck to the walls yeah. and this and that. And, and if that were the case, when docs would go in for colonoscopies, the prep wouldn't have cleaned things out. Right. Mm -hmm. They would mm -hmm. see the old stool on there. And as far as I can tell, and, and I'm no gastroenterologist and I'd love to have someone on, but we'll, we'll see if I can get somebody. Um, I, I do not see stool stuck to the side of the colon when I've looked at people's results. And I'd be very curious to see if that really is the case. If, if you can be cleaned out by these colon preps, which we could probably talk a lot about the chemicals and things in colon prep. Oh um, yeah. I mean, I didn't like taking it when I was, had to have mine done last year. It was, you know, it's not something that is that you want to take on a regular basis. Yeah. Let's 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 talk about medications and chemicals and things of that nature because I I literally have some patients that no joke cannot tolerate the colon prep, the golightlies and and things because mm -hmm. they literally are throwing it up. They yeah. cannot get it down. What what have you seen in terms of of folks in in colonoscopy prep and and different your, from your pharmacist view on it, what do you think is the, the thing that bugs people the most in, in those kind of medications? I think some, well, one, sometimes it's the flavor. Um, and two, it depends on, how, like, this is my favorite. And I got my list from my doctor on what I could eat. And of course it was like Gatorade, pure sugar, Jello, pure sugar, all these pure sugar things and use, um, the the or the artificial sweeteners, mm -hmm. the power aid. And I'm like, no, I'm using Ultima. I'm using an electrolyte supplement that is that is good for me for mine. And I think sometimes it's the overload of drinking because most people don't drink enough during the day anyway. Mm -hmm. And you're having to get about this amount of liquid down. I think that's part of it. Um the sodium, it could be a sodium imbalance too that that's causing them to to kind of like have a um, nauseated, but I think a lot of it's the gag reflex. It's just, it's not the most pleasant thing. You know, what's going to happen. You know, you have to drink this 
eight ounces every, what, every 30 minutes for, it depends on what protocol it is. And I, th- there's a lot of, I would say, I want to say backlash, but just, I, 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 the worst part was the prep. Honestly, the worst part was the prep for me too. And if you can get through on your head being like, okay, I can get through this prep, then you'll be okay. Is it, is it pleasant? No. Is it necessary? Unfortunately, yes, because you do have to be clean in order for them to see what's going on. And because of the incidence of the increase in colon cancer, like I just turned, I won't say just, I'm 53. I missed 50 because COVID. So I missed my year that I was supposed to get it. And so I was a couple of years behind, but during that time, they changed the minimum age to, I think, 45 now mm-hmm. because of the increase of colon cancer that they're seeing in people under 50. Yeah. So it's one of those things that is definitely, I think, necessary. Um, I'm going to throw my brother on the bus because he never listens to podcasts anyway, but he's younger than me and has polyps. I had no nothing. I'm clear, but there's also a very difference on how I eat compared to how he eats. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because he's had polyps, I'm now on the five-year plan. Thanks a bunch, brother. Um, (laughs) Because just to make sure, because they're afraid it's hereditary. And I'm like, it's, and trying to argue that, no, it's not hereditary. It's because he eats like crap and I don't. And it's a different thing, but understand that, you know, I will definitely do the five years just because one, it's treatable. If we, if we catch it early, it's treatable. It's the worst, probably say prep, but it is doable. Um, the only thing that I had issues with afterwards was getting my bowels back into, I would say normal to normal, having my stomach not feel distended, having that normal, um, that normal kind of feeling, I guess. And, that's where I had to get my probiotics in because I had to get that that natural bacteria back in because it wipes everything out, mm-hmm. and we need that bacteria. So I don't. That's why I'm not a big fan of colon cleanses for diet. You need that bacteria. You absolutely need it. It's a good point you bring up because I think a lot of people, especially in the functional medicine space, are contemplating whether colonoscopy is a right choice for them. Um, mm-hmm. just based on their gut because of the wiping out of, of the bacteria. And, and this is good for folks to hear because, I mean, it is something that's part of my colon protocol for folks is if they're do, they're going for a colonoscopy, I'm like, okay, afterwards we got to get, you know, your gut rebooted. We've got to use, I, I use glutamine and I'll use, you know, mm-hmm. different things to reboot the gut lining, tributrin, and then I'll also add in probiotics. It's kind of like a whole gut repair mm-hmm. um, reboot. And, and, and it seems to do the trick. And I feel like a lot of people, once the gut comes back online after that, they they do a lot better overall. So, you know, it is interesting. Now, now the one thing you had mentioned was the electrolytes instead of the, did you do electrolytes instead of the traditional um, stuff? Like, so I do Miralax. So, do okay. Yeah. Okay. So I did Miralax. So I did Miralax um, and used use Ultima as, which is a electrolyte drink, um, to flavor it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, made my big, what was it? Half gallon, gallon, whatever it was. And did it that way because I wasn't going to do the power aid that was, you know, I'm not someone, you know, I'm pre, I was pre-diabetic a long time ago and I don't need to have the sugar crash, the sugar rush. And, and I don't do, um, aspartame or Splenda and that's what's in power aid. And, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, and I was doing the the bone broth and, and things that were healthy for me, a better choice than what was on that nice little prep list that I got. Got you. Got you. Good. Good to know. Cause yeah, I have a lot of people that will ask me kind of what's, what's an alternative kind of option. And we've tried to use magnesium citrates and, and things of that nature yeah. instead of the, the, um, Miralax and in some cases it's worked for folks, but other cases mm-hmm. it's not. And, and so I, I think it's just, it's just cool to hear kind of what you've done and, and how it worked. I like, I like to hear what other people are up to in that department. It's, I don't know, colon, colon cleansing and, and, and colon, <laughs> colonoscopies. How do we get on this subject? <laughs> So, we're just ripping today just talking yeah. well you know it's good stuff it's good stuff it's all things that people have to go through right it, it's 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 life now one of the other things that i think a lot of people um are on and we had mentioned it before are anti-allergy meds 
um, whether it's Sear Tech, whether it's Allegra, whether it's, you know, any of those or the Flonase um, nasal sprays. And you were mentioning something that I hadn't thought about because it's hard to keep up with what's in every med and what's in every food and the hidden things and everything. And this is something I really want folks to think about. But you had mentioned that you have a patient, you had a, had a client that was doing all the things to lose weight and she was struggling and, and had a dairy allergy. G give us a scoop. I'm telling your story and I want you to. So, so there's a couple things. So let's, let's, yeah. uh, let, let's do the simple part first. So if you're on your, people are not going to be happy with me because it's allergy season. Um, yeah. any, the, any of the antihistamines that cross that cross the blood brain barrier. So we're looking at Benadryl, Zyrtec, Allegra, um, are the big ones. The one that doesn't is, is, um, Claritin, loratadine. If you're having problems losing weight, you might want to consider getting off of the antihistamines. And studies have shown that it can hinder you from losing weight. Now, of course, you know, if you listen to the last podcast, we don't care about really weight, it's about inches. But still, if you're not having, if you're finding that you're static, you're not losing some inches, it could be the antihistamines. Not really sure what the mechanism is. We just know it has something to do with, with them going over the blood-brain barrier. So Claritin is another choice because it doesn't. However, most people will say, well, Claritin doesn't really work that well. So here's what I say when you're doing antihistamines and even Flonase. Flonase is a steroid for your nose. Your body gets used to those and it stops working. And it drives me nuts, especially in the nursing home when I see somebody on an antihistamine or Flonase for years because those should be used what's called PRN, as needed. You use it for the flare-up and then you stop. Now, I understand there's other, there's some people who have severe allergies and that might just be a way of life and that's what you're going to have to take. But if you're taking it for seasons, if you're taking it for sleep, which is not a good idea, um, all the time, then you need to start backing off on it because your body's getting used to it. It's your body can actually form kind of an addiction to, um, to those. If you use Afrin, which is a nasal decongestant, you should only be using that three times, about three days, because you can get something that's called nasal rebound, where you actually are even more congested than when you started. So anything it has to do with allergies, you should take it as needed, not as a routine chronic basis. Now, what we were talking about before is that I have a client that has something that's called alpha-gal syndrome. And if you don't know what alpha-gal syndrome is, it is caused by a tick bite. We don't have a, have a sugar or protein called alpha-gal. The tick pretty much puts it in our system and our body absorbs it and it becomes part of our DNA. The problem is, is that with alpha-gal, you no longer can digest meat products. So one day you're able to eat a hamburger, the next day it's causing you to have a severe allergic reaction, even anaphylactic allergic reaction out of nowhere. And it goes misdiagnosed quite a bit. Um, one, I think because it's new. Two, because it just seems like a lot of, uh, well, all my clients are female who have it. And I don't know if it's, more prevalent in female and or men, but I do see it more in females. And of course, sometimes with females, we have to really bang on the door when we know something's not right. And I have one of my nutrition clients, this is what was going on, was that she was gaining weight and doing everything right. Everything. We were doing whole foods. She's lifting. She's not, um, her hormones are fine. We can't figure out why she's distended extremely distended after certain things that she would eat, even get worse. She took, this drives me nuts. She took her, uh, her food log to her doctor and her doctor looked at her and goes, nobody eats this clean. Really? Just, just nobody eats this clean. This, this can't be you. You must be doing something wrong. Not listening to her, not looking at any of this, she goes for a colonoscopy, it's fine. They thought maybe it was celiacs. No. Finally gets somebody in the ER after she's having hives everywhere. He's like, this could be alpha gal. And we had thought about that. 
And she was going to ask for that test and it came back just blaring. Yes, this is alpha gal syndrome. So with alpha gal, she can't have anything that has mammalian products. She had something, have no idea what she had, hives, really bad, had to go to the ER. They got it down. And the ER doctor says, well, just take Zyrtec the next time. And she's texting me and, and we're looking it up and Zyrtec has lactose in it, which is mammalian. And the doctor says, oh, that shouldn't be a problem. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's a problem. Do not take that whatsoever. And the disconnect sometimes with something that's a new diagnosis, but also trying to understand the inert ingredients in medication because they're not listed. They'll say inactive ingredients, or if you're lucky, you'll have some of the inactive ingredients. In food, it's natural flavoring or mm-hmm. other flavors. Mm-hmm. You could have something that's supposedly vegan or vegetarian, but it could still have something that has part mammalian. Um, I didn't know until I started working with her and really doing research that sugar is, so however it's cut, is cut with a mammalian product. And so she can't have normal sugar. It's crazy of some of the supplements out there that are from a mammal source, but it's not labeled as such. And if you are, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't eat meat without something happened or my stomach hurt or a headache or joint pain or a rash, I would highly recommend getting this getting this test just because it is increasing and increasing, increasing, especially if you live someplace with lots of ticks. And and you know, maybe you've been maybe you've already been tested for Lyme disease and that came back negative, but it could be something like this. And it's just those weird things that come about. It's getting more, I won't say, I won't say prevalent, but it's getting more, I wouldn't say press or people understanding, but the medical community hasn't caught up yet. And it takes forever for things to change with ingredient labeling and ask anybody with the top nine allergens that they, they've been fighting this one for years, trying to get things labeled to be where I know exactly what's in this food. I mean, we know it's in our fruits. We know what's in our vegetables. We know, we know those kind of things. But if you're picking up something that maybe is a potato chip bag and it says natural flavors, well, what are those natural flavors? Or if you look up, you know, your medication, you're like, okay, so I know my Claritin's loratadine, but what's actually in this pill? What are the other things? And they'll say inactive ingredients, you know, or other inactive ingredients. And you're like, well, so what are those? What's the source? And that's really hard to find out sometimes. And it's, you have to be your own advocate. That is the thing like that drives me nuts, like drives me nuts about the food labeling industry. And we had just talked about, and I just looked it up because I wanted to get her name, uh, oh. Orla Baxendale. The dancer uh, from New York. The dancer from New York that that died because of mislabeling of a product. And here's the thing, like my my dear friend, her, she's my, like one of my best friends here in Wisconsin, her son has eosinophilia, um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to mess it up. EOE. We this is the problem with healthcare and short shortening of things. Yeah. Did you use the abbreviations? You can't remember what the condition is. Yes, I can't even think. EOE. It's a throat thing, basically, where there's allergies to multiple of the nine. You know, it, it, mm. multiple things within the the most common nine allergens. And his is like peanut. His is egg. And it's it's um. One other thing, I'll get it wrong, so I'm not going to say it, but a peanut and egg, I know for sure. And like, we have to read all the labels. And then at the same time, she's always like EpiPen on the on guard with EpiPen. Right. I can't trust any of these, these companies. I don't even know what to do anymore. And that's, you know, that's, I think she, she was from Europe and came over to dance in New York and had a cookie. It was labeled peanut free. It was mislabeled. And she even used the EpiPen. And had an anaphylactic, um, anaphylactic reaction to it, and it's it's it it makes you scared because you don't know what's in the food. Because if they mislabeled that, what else are they mislabeling? Not only them, but everybody else. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's why I keep saying over and over again: ultra processed foods are not our friends. We don't know what's in them. We don't. And 
Yeah. And another thing that got me really ticked off is like, you know, someone puts a chemical structure on it and it was, you know, what is this? And people like, oh, don't eat that. It's chemicals. I'm like, okay, BS. It's fruit, right? Everything does have a chemical structure. You know, my headset right now that I have chemical structure, my sweater, chemical structure, the blueberries I had, they have a chemical structure. That's not what I'm talking about. When I say ultra processed foods, added chemicals, added chemicals, things that are made in a freaking lab, Mm -hmm. things that are made that have better mouthfeel so that you are addicted to this stuff that has, makes it have a better shelf life. All of that is what we don't need. Does it have a chemical structure just like blueberries does? It does. But there's a big freaking difference between that, a blueberry, and what you're putting in blueberry top pop tarts. Mm-hmm. Huge difference. And to say that they're the same just because there are chemicals and everything has a chemicals is just, I just want to smack people. <laughs> it is funny how how we've like forgot, I guess, like basic biology chemistry. You know, in school, we are taught all, like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? All mm-hmm. the main components of sugar and the whole long sugar molecule. You know, I, I think people forget that they're made of every single, the whole, I'm almost chemical soup right here. We, we are. I think you might even say chemical soup on previous, I mean, we are chemical soup and, and foods that have chemical soup with modifications, because here's the thing, what Amy's talking about is modifications to the chemistry, you know, food flavorings, chemistry but modifications to the nap, mm-hmm. like blueberry molecule gets all the carbons, the hydrogens, you know, we're tweaking them things and we're putting things on them. Um, I think everybody's got to go back to organic chemistry. I think that's where we're at. Like, I we, think we're we making everything as Frankenstein. So if we take something and make it supercharged or make something that it's addicting, make something that has a better mouthfeel, we're trying to improve it. And it's not improving. It's improving it for for the companies, you know, who want to sell something, but it's not improving for your health. And that's where we have to start thinking about things in health and longevity. And, you know, we talked about before skinny, it's like skinny is not healthy. We need to start thinking about longevity and how are we going to live our best lives? And it comes down to taking it back down to the basics. And I know we don't want to cook and I know we want things that are fast. I mean, believe me, I'm like, I look at the blue zone people I'm like, man, they cook every meal from scratch. Holy crap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. it, but you know, there's a trade-off. There's a definite trade-off. Their lives are much better. Their lives are much slower. We're n- They're not living in this, keeping up with the Joneses in this fast pace. And I got to do this and I got to do this. And if I don't do this, I'm a failure. It's really embracing the joy of life. And I think that's part of the thing that we have to get back to is embracing real food, embracing the joy of life. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And embracing like, and this is one of the hard things because I understand that if you've cooked for a family for, you know, 30 years and, and you're overcooking, like, how can we reignite that fire and that interest to cook again? And, and take it to a level that's yes, easy for you. And and that's the one thing I was trying to tell folks, like my, I think a lot of people look at stuff, folks like you and I, and they think that we're like whizzes in the kitchen and that, <laughs> like we have these like amazing right. dinners and stuff. And I'm like, my stuff nope. is so basic. Like sometimes it's like chicken, um, salt, pepper, mm-hmm. more garlic, a little onion, and then like a whole buttload of whatever veggies that I pulled out of either the freezer or my, my cellar, you know? <laughs> hey, I just invested in some nice pans for the first time. And my husband's like, they were falling apart. He's like, we have got to get rid of these pans that, you know, that, that look like we've had them since college. But that's, I'm not a gourmet cook, but we do cook real food. And yeah, that's, that's part of it. And make, and we make it easy. We do make it easy. And I'm not going to lie. Yes. Are there some processed things that I do, but they're processed healthy. And I look at the ingredients and, and are they, are they real ingredients? Like once it's a chickpea thing. So it has chickpea and it has curry and the, it has a a little bit of sea salt Very easy, very good. And it's something I can, that I can either heat up or put in the microwave. Okay. It's, it's a go-to and Mm -hmm. add that with a chicken breast, add that with a, with a salad or some broccoli. It's, it's a great meal. It took me 10 minutes. 
And, and something you meant, two things you mentioned. One, I would love to hear your version of processed healthy. And two, a lot of people will be like, oh my God, use the microwave. Like that, I, I, know. I thought I had to stop using the microwave. Like I thought I couldn't use it. And, <laughs> and it's one of those things where like, I'm like, if it's going to stand between you and not having closest to nature foods, I want you to use mm -hmm. the microwave because it's yeah. going to be faster. For you in a perfect world i would be cooking everything i would be using my stove or my instant pot i or my oven i wouldn't be using the microwave let's be real i'm a pharmacist full-time a nutrition coach full-time pick your battles now there is process healthy so something like process healthy frozen broccoli is considered process healthy um uh, there are you know you can get you can get some rice that is already pre-made for you that you can just heat up processed healthy where it's, we used to say, you know, no processed food, no processed food. Well, then, then ultra processed food came around and we're like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a big distinction between something that's ready for you. And what I don't mean is healthy choice, lean cuisine, weight watchers, meals in, in the freezer section, because what that is, is that is actually ultra processed food that's disguised as healthy food. There's a difference between processed food that's actually healthy and, and ultra processed food disguised as healthy. So when you're looking at something that is relatively easy, maybe, maybe you're going to the grocery store and they already have chicken breast made for you. Okay. See what the ingredients are, see how they did it. And that could be processed healthy. It doesn't have added dyes, added chemicals, added preservatives. It's real food that's kind of gone in a, in a I would say, an easy state or a, a healthy state. But it makes it much easier for you to get onto the table and much quicker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you know, if we if I was had all the money in the world, maybe I'd have a chef. I don't know. It's like, or if I had all the time, maybe I would cook it. Eh, let's be honest. No, I wouldn't. So it has to be something that's doable for me. And that's what I do with all my clients is like, it has to be doable for you. We have to make it work with your life and make it be the best choices possible. And, you know, it's, it's pick your battles. Okay. Are you going to go for a candy bar because you don't want to use the microwave? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Use the microwave. Yep. Yep. That's that's what you have to think about. It's it's one of those things that we're like, oh well, my doctor says I can't have eggs because of high cholesterol, but it said nothing about the alcohol and the sugar and the chips and everything else that has been going on in your life and stress. But we just hone in on the eggs. So we're just picking something that actually we shouldn't be picking at all. Oh, that's such a huge that's a huge one right there is the the single ingredient foods when yeah, we haven't talked about the seed oils and and all mm -hmm. the other stuff on it. No, one of the big things that that I get from a lot of my patients and and something that I'd love your input on being a pharmacist is is the medicate the chronic medications, meaning the resuvastatins, the you know, Crestor for you guys who are listening, if you know the common name, you know, the Cinepril's, the synthroids, the, those kind of things, you know, a lot of people do question being on those and are they impacting with certain ingredients? Are they impacting someone's food sensitivity component, someone's toxicity or multiple chem chemical sensitivity component? So my question is really like, are there, like we had talked about in terms of the Allegra, are there other types of medications that you know of that have allergens that mess with people and their ability to lose weight, their ability to thrive. In there would be, I would say it's possible. I don't know for sure because of course that hasn't been studied, but I would say anything is possible. Mm -hmm. What you have to remember is medication is a treatment. A lot of times it's not a cure. I and mean, I think we talked about this last time, you know, something like Synthroid, if your thyroid is subpar, you might need that extra thyroid hormone. It's not something that's be like, oh, congratulations, your thyroid just cured itself. Usually it doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. But you can do everything to make whatever's left of your thyroid optimal, less stress. Are you, um, and this might rub people the wrong way, are you eating gluten? Because we know with Hashimoto's and some other things that gluten sometimes is not a thyroid's friend. Are you doing keto? Because your thyroid needs hormone or needs, needs, needs carbs. Your thyroid hormone needs carbs. 
So are you doing things to make your thyroid work the best possible? When it comes to lisinopril, when it comes to the statins, especially statins, we know there is a, I'm one of them, it's in my genetics, I cannot metabolize statins right. And what I love is something called pharmacogenetics or genomics. And what that is, and I honestly believe that everybody should have this test because if you ever have to go on medication, it tells you what your body can process and what your body can't process. Instead of practicing medicine, which, you know, most doctors will be like, I practice medicine. So this is what I do. And we start with this first. Well, your DNA tells you this medication is going to work better for me than this medication. I can't metabolize this medication. I can metabolize this other medication. Is it cheap? No. Um, what I don't want is people be to take this test and be like, oh, okay, well, give me this, this, and this because there's a pill for everything. And that's what I'm going to do for my blood pressure or my diabetes instead of, hey, let's try the natural holistic way of working on our diet and working on our exercise first, because that does cure hypertension, diabetes. It can, it can reverse it. But if you have to go on medication, it's so cool to know that if you take this test, that there are certain medications that are optimal for you, that will work better, that you won't have side effects or as many side effects with. So we do know that. And like I said, especially statins are a big one because if you don't metabolize them right, you get muscle pain and get severe muscle pain. And then what happens is, okay, well, you know, we can try your diet, but maybe we're not going to do your diet. We're just going to try another one. We'll go a lower dose to see if this works because this one doesn't have as much possibility of causing your, your muscles to ache. And, and it could be like, for me, I just can't take statins. It's, it's, I cannot metabolize them. Now, have I ever been on statin? No, uh, but I know from my DNA test that I cannot metabolize them. Yeah, no, I think it's important to do the testing to know what, what is possible and, and what, you know, isn't, I think another thing, and, and I'm sure you can speak to this too, is, is, I will, if I do suspect that someone's responding negatively to fillers in a medication, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's necessarily the medication, I'll have it compounded and, yeah. and use the compounding pharmacy. Kind of pharmacy. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be having. Well, in, in pharmaceuticals, and they don't have to list a lot of times the inactive ingredients and it doesn't have to be, something could change where they get their inactive ingredients. It may look a little bit different. It may be a different color. Um, different manufacturers use different fillers. And so when you have it compounded, you can be specific. Okay, I want you to compound it in XYZ and use, you know, whatever, maybe it's usually it's lactose or so whatever they're using it to, to fill the capsule or if it's a cream, whatever vehicle that you want it in. So you get a little more of a control with what that medication you're getting that you're getting that active ingredient and then you have control over what those fillers are and that's you know that is it's thank god we have that really because for some people certain fillers can be a trigger and if you don't know and remember when i when when celiacs was just kind of like getting known and someone couldn't be on gluten it was harder than hell to, and this is when I was in retail, somebody come in and saying, I'm gluten-free. Can you tell me if this medication has gluten in it? Um, nope. There was only a couple manufacturers at that time who would mark things specifically gluten-free. It was not the norm. And that's hard. So when you have that control and sometimes it is more expensive to get things compounded because insurance won't pay for it. But if you know that it's going to work for you, you know, you're not going to have a reaction it can be worth it. Yeah. And you mentioned like lactose being kind of a common filler. I, I often will switch people to cellulose, which is used typically a birch, birch tree fiber, mm -hmm. which now, of course, if someone has a birch allergy, mm -hmm. now we got to figure that out. Right. Or potato starch is another one that's commonly mm -hmm. used, but if there's a potato or nightshade, you know, I, 
I swear, like in another life, I should have been a compounding pharmacist because I, I geek out heavily on trying to find the right things for folks. But it it is something that, you know, I, I do think for folks doing their due diligence on on the that side of things, knowing what, what you're putting in your body, especially if, if you start a new medication and you don't feel good or you've noticed the color changed. And so, you know, your pharmacy's filling from a different manufacturer yeah. for, for things. I think it's really important. You be your own self-advocate. I think that's what we keep saying is it, you know, something's wrong, you know, you know, you don't feel good. You know, something's wrong. Be your own self-advocate, whether it's with medication, whether it's just with your health period me like, you know what? I don't want to feel like this anymore. I'm going to take, I'm going to take my health in, in my hands and say, you know what? I can feel better. I can do better. And whether it's throwing your hands up and saying enough, let's, let's, let's figure this out. Let's get help. Let's, let's lose the inches. Let's go for longevity or whether, you know, you're, you're going to a doctor and they're not listening to you, then you know, and I've had that before. It's like my sister just went to a physician and her A1C was slightly elevated. She's been doing all the things that she's supposed to is getting better. And the first thing that they offer her was semaglutide. And she's like, no. And like, but you don't understand this will help. And she's like, but no. And they were so insistent that she should be put on semaglutide that she's like, she found another doctor. I was like, good for you. Because that's not where she wants. She's she hears me. We've seen it with a family member. What it what what it's done, and it's and it's not something that we want to be part of. But she was her own self advocate and was like, you know what? I'm going to find someone who aligns with me and listens to me and understands what I what I want to do. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's so important. And unfortunately, I do think we're still kind of we're getting better. But I think as as older, I would say women over 40, we're still kind of taught that the doctor's the authority and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we should listen to what the doctor says. Doctor knows best. But I mean, like I tell my patients, I work for you. Like yeah. I work for you. You tell me what you're thinking. And if you don't like what I recommended, then let's find something that feels good to you. Like, cause I'm not here to, I'm not here to be the authority. I mean, yes, I'm here to guide, yeah. to keep people out of trouble, but I'm not here to be the authority. Well, if you're on all these medications, one, I'm not going to say, oh my God, how are you on these medications? No, 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 no. But if you want to get healthy and you are starting to eat better and you are starting to lift weights. So here's things I tell my clients that you need to look out for. If you're on blood pressure medication, how do you feel every morning? Are you exhausted? Are you having what's called orthostatic hypertension? Are you standing up and all of a sudden you get that tunnel vision? Or are you getting headaches? And I tell my clients that, especially when they first start, because the first two weeks, a lot of inflammation is lost the first two weeks. I want you to take your blood pressure every single morning because we want to see if there's a trend and more than likely your blood pressure is coming down and that's why you're not feeling good. It's not that, you know, it's, it's not the opposite that you would think, oh, I'm not feeling good. It must be something about this, about getting healthy, that this is not good. Well, your blood pressure pill is doing exactly what it's supposed to. Now that you are helping your body do it naturally, it's working a little too well. And it's the same thing if you're on anything for diabetes is that once we start getting rid of the inflammation, once we start balancing blood sugar naturally, okay, you might get the same thing. You might be tired. You might be shaky. You might feel ill, headaches, double vision, brain fog, and all of that might be from having too low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And I always am saying, it's like, you know, I am a pharmacist. I don't prescribe, but this is where I'm going to work with your physician. And we're going to work on changing your dose while we're on this. And with, with the goal to be on the lowest effective dose or maybe even off. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing with being on antidepressant pills and anxiety. Once you start getting your gut microbiome in check, once you start getting your blood sugar, you may notice that you don't need these higher doses of anti-anxiety and antidepressant meds because we're getting those neurotransmitters, the dopamine, the serotonin. It's all starting to work a little bit better because we're giving your body what it needs to, to do the chemical processes, the enzyme processes. And you're now feeding, I would say almost like feeding your soul. You're feeding it what it needs. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, and that's like, and I think it's funny you mentioned that in terms of like people think like immediately, like it must be the diet that's messing things yeah, up. It's yeah, yeah, it must be the diet. Yeah. It's like, 
No. We're, we're trained with that. We're trained with that because we're trained to say that, oh, well, it must be what we're eating mm-hmm. that is messing it up. It must be what, you know, I didn't feel this way when I ate my other food. Right. It's, it's, you didn't realize how bad you felt until you start actually feeling good, but you know, it's you're because you're losing this inflammation because your blood pressure is going down because your blood sugar is going down the way it's supposed to that, you know, the extra medication is not, is not needed. So we need to start working with your doctor to slowly back it off. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things I, I totally want to know from, from your perspective and, and what you've seen just working with clients with weight loss, how long on average does it take for someone to like on average, I know not everyone's the same to, to come off of a, a blood pressure med, like meaning like their body's like, I'm doing better. I don't need this or I don't need, you know, the, the I'll give you the quick and I'll give you the, the, the longer okay. one. So the quickest I've seen is two weeks, which was crazy crazy. And this is somebody who we had, who had familial hypertension. So was always told you'll be on blood pressure medication the rest of your life because it runs in your family. Mm -hmm. And in two weeks, same thing. She wasn't feeling good. She was like, wait a minute, why is this? I'm like, start taking your blood pressure, sent her readings to her doctor. is like, oh no, we're getting you off. We're getting you off. I was thinking, okay, we're going to cut your dose in half for a little bit and then say, nope. So she got off. Then the other ones have been about six to 12 weeks where depending on what dose they were on to begin with. And so it's usually taking it down half and then maybe another quarter and then slowly getting off. Now, do I have some people who are still kind of like borderline because there is something going on familial? Yes, but they're on extremely, extremely low dose. And then it's with the possibility of possibly getting off sometime we're just kind of They're right there. And depending on where your physician is, on what number they want to see is where, right? Because once again, we're treating the numbers (laughs) sometimes. And they're so afraid about being over, um, you know, some people want that 120 over 80 when that's not always the natural. I mean, I'm always very low. So my blood pressure is never 120 over 80. And, you know, they might be 125 over 85, but they want to keep them on there, which I get, you know, I get, but the whole idea is that we get you on either the lowest effective dose, or if we can get you off, that'd be great. Now diabetes, pretty much that has been usually, well, because we go by A1C a lot of times. And so that's usually three months because A1C is a three month snapshot. If somebody has has been, has been diagnosed with prediabetes and if they're on metformin or if they're on um, some kind of oral diabetic, anti-diabetic medication. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's good. That's good parameters for folks to hear that. I mean, it's not years, right? We're not no. talking years mm-hmm. and we're not talking, you know, uh, yeah, we're just not talking a lot of time. You can turn things around pretty quickly. You know, and, you know, menopausal symptoms, two weeks, headaches, two weeks, getting your rings back on two to three weeks, um, zipping up your favorite pants, just depends. Depends on where it is. This is why I always tell people. It's like, okay, I have people take pictures, not necessarily just always measurements and definitely not the scale because on measurements, there's about eight places I have them take their measurement. But we all know, I want you to go look in the mirror right now. Your eyes go straight to whatever part that you hate the most. Mm-hmm. And that's the only place you ever look to see if you are getting better. And I get that with clients all the time. Like, but, but, but I'm like, take your picture and then I'll have them do a side by side. And it's amazing to see how their arms have changed. And what I mean by their arms is like where their arms are kind of laying by their side. All of a sudden we see some differences on, there is more space between the elbow and the waistline Mm -hmm. where their hands hit on their legs or their their hips is totally different. You can see collarbones, you can see cheekbones, you can see less of a double chin, you can see muscle indentation and all these things before you never realized because you were so focused on that one part. And then the other part too, is that, you know, this may be TMI, I don't know, but I was actually going to do a reel on this. The other thing is the biggest non-scale victory for most of my clients is when their underwear stops digging into their sides. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize it until there's like, man, that doesn't itch anymore. Why is that? And it's like, because it's not digging into your sides anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is usually within the first six weeks. Nice. 
So it's not years. And so I think a lot of people might right now might be like, okay, Amy, you have a blueprint. You you have, you know, a program <laughs> that 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 works with this. Tell us a little bit more. I know we briefly touched last podcast, and I think for folks to really understand kind of what, what's going down, I would love for you to kind of explain the the faster way. Okay. So I use a I use a platform um that's called the faster way to fat loss. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I use this is because I believe in it because I was a client, still am a client, and it worked for me. And it was something that brought in health, that's something that brought in real food and it brought in weight lifting. It takes away the I have to work out for hours a day. It takes away the I got a calorie count. Yes, we do macro tracking. And some people are like, oh my God, I can't macro track. We can all macro track. The thing is, I always tell people is like, it's not going to make you obsessive because we don't eat enough. We really don't. You don't realize it. We're overfed, undernourished big time with, with ultra processed foods. But when you start eating real food, the amount that you have to eat is crazy. And I have to track because if I don't track, I don't eat enough. Mm-hmm. And it is using me as a coach because you don't know what you don't know. And it's not just about giving you the blueprint, which you can get the blueprint from me. Absolutely. I can give you the blueprint. However, if your behavior so is a go-to for a Snickers bar at 2 p.m. or you don't eat or you're having stress-related anxiety issues that you don't know how to handle and your go-to has always been Ben and Jerry's or you're like, I need to work out. I just don't know how to figure that out. How can I habit stack this? You need someone, a coach to help you navigate this new way of life because I can give everybody the blueprint. It'll work for some people, but more than likely, it's not going to be the thing that kind of like clicks in your brain. What clicks in your brain is behaviors. And so with the first six weeks, it's all about those baby steps. It's incorporating all these good foods. It's incorporating workouts. It's incorporating, we do intermittent fasting. Um, And by the way, intermittent fasting is not a diet. It's a tool. So if anybody does intermittent fasting, like, oh, but I can eat whatever I want. No, 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 no. You can't eat crap. Uh Uh-uh. Because now you're not doing your body any service. Intermittent fasting, we use it as a tool for autophagy, which means cell turnout. We use it to decrease insulin resistance, increase insulin sensitivity, helping with you sleep. There's so many, th- there's so many good things about intermittent fasting, but we're not using it as a diet, meaning that you still have to eat. It's not something that says, oh, well, I can just eat one meal a day because that doesn't work, that you don't get enough nutrition. So we're really focusing on the nutrition so that your body can heal. I always say we're healing from the inside out. And guess what? That takes time and you need a coach to keep reminding you that that takes time because we're always like, but, 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 but my friend got 10 days was back in their bikini. And I'm like, yeah, where's your friend in 10 months? Right. And what you have to realize is every time that you do those yo-yo dieting, every time that you do something that is going to cause you to lose weight so fast, you're losing muscle, you're losing metabolism and you are aging yourself. And the one thing that I don't want, and this is my mission in life, is to keep you out of my nursing homes. Because in midlife, we have a very small window of opportunity to get it together. And we can thrive and we can live this amazing life well into our 80s and 90s and 100s, or we continue what we're doing and we promote disease. And I don't think that's what we want to do. I think we want to thrive. And you need that cheerleader. You need that person to help you. You need that person to say, answer your questions. And I don't like fish. So what do I eat? Okay. Here's your options. I don't like chicken. What do I eat? Okay. This is, we do something called carb cycling. So there's two days a week that we'll do um, higher fat, lower carbs. And then the rest of the time we call it regular macro days. Okay. I don't know what to do. How do I do this? And that's where I'm there to help you. Or it's regular, regular days. Like I have to eat this many carbs. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I'll be there to un- tell you, okay, this is what's happening with your hormones. This is why your body needs carbs. This is what happens. And that's why you use a, use the coach. So I do a six week program just to get the basics, the foundation. 
And then if somebody wants to continue on with me, it's something called VIP because you still get the workouts every day. They're 30 minutes. They're right into your house via an app. There's so many good things. That's one of the reasons why I use this platform is because there's so many good things about it. And then you get me as your coach. And I honestly believe in one-on-one. I believe in the group because of the community, but I also believe in the power of the human connection. And you have to be able to be able to talk to me, to be able to text to me, to have that connection. Because if you don't have that connection, then you just, you know, I think a lot of us midlife, we were the odd girls out and, you know, we didn't have anybody we could go to or ask and, or we saw the perfect and we thought we should be the perfects. Was that part of the mean girls, the perfects, Mm -hmm. you know, we, and we still see that on Instagram and understand not being relatable. And so am I going to be your BFF? I'd like to be your BFF, but I'm also going to be your tough love sister. That's going to tell you the way it is and what you need to do. And that's, I guess that's in a long nutshell. You know, it's great that you're mentioning all, all the ins and outs, right? Cause we really, it's, it's having something like an accountability buddy, really. Yeah, it you really know? is. Yeah. And you mentioned there's that short window of getting our shit together before we, we really end up into chronic disease land. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to see from your experience, like I'd love for you to tell us from your experience with nursing home patients, like looking at their charts, how fast, like on average, if you had to ballpark it, because I know you can't give me like full on, you know, like without a doubt, this is the thing. How, how long would you say it really does take someone to go from like just starting the twinges and, and little bits of diabetes or high blood pressure till it's full on cardiovascular disease and we've got like, you know, like slow. I would I honestly, I see less than five years. And here's the thing. Okay. Our bodies are telling us before we have that diagnosis, before we have our diag- that diagnosis, something's going on. Our bodies are giving us signals. We just don't choose to listen to them. But then we go to a doctor, not you, we go to the doctor and they say, you're borderline. Let's just watch it. Yeah. Watch what? Really? Really? What are we going to watch? We're going to watch it go full diabetes, full hypertension. What are we watching? Instead of saying, this is our window of opportunity to nip it in the bud now. You need to change. You need to figure out how to eat. How can we work? How can we manage your stress? Like, I, you know, I have a client right now who just started with me. She is a nurse. Her A1C was 12. And Yeah. And she sent me her labs and, uh, and she's like, I have to, she had, she, and I would say most people have something like something they hit rock bottom, they do something. And her story was like, I got to do something. I need to take care of myself now. Mm-hmm. And she is doing that and she's doing all the things she's doing amazing, but she had to come to that realization that she was not going to go down this path. Right. And that's what we have to decide is that, okay, I still can live. I still can enjoy a cookie. I still can enjoy life. I'm not dieting because when you diet, yeah, that does. It's like, what, die with a T, right? (laughs) It's like, it's, it's it's taking the fun out of life. When you actually are fueling your body, when you're actually eating real stuff, you know, when blueberries become candy and yes, they do, believe it or not, they do become taste like candy. When you have energy, when you don't crash every evening because you're exhausted, you sleep because you need sleep and your body is actually recovering and you start seeing muscle and you are able to zip up your pants and your blood pressure goes down, your A1C goes down, your cholesterol comes back to the, the normal and your thyroid is actually functioning optimally and let alone your, your hormones, because it's all one big, big system. It's not all these individual systems that we keep trying to, trying to do. It's like, everything's connected. And when we can connect the dots and connect everything, it's crazy how good you can feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wholeheartedly agree. I wholeheartedly agree. And on that point, I feel like this is a great mic drop, really, because it's like, it's so crazy how good you can feel when you get things dialed in. And this is where I want, I want this for everyone. And I know you do too. I do. I want, I want people to feel good. Does it take work? Yes. That's why you have somebody help you because we can't do everything on our own. I have a coach. I mean, we can't do everything on our own. So why I don't 
you know, self-prescribe. I go to somebody else who's an expert. We're not meant to do everything on our own. We're meant to have this, like, I want to say sisterhood, but maybe sisterhood, whatever it is to help each other out and lift each other up mm-hmm. and, and make us the best that we can possibly be and understands the journey. You start today and hopefully you don't end until whenever I take my last breath. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I do think, like you said, women banding together, that's why we're doing this, right? That's why we're getting together and like sharing the, the information that we have to folks. And and hopefully, you know, those of you who are listening, I hope this has made an impact, especially that concept of things can go South in five years. I really want folks to think about that. And the time is now to, to make change and it doesn't have to be drastic one step at a time. So huge. Very huge. Wow. Amy, thanks for coming on again. I know yeah. we'll be chatting more as time goes on, but this one's a good one. I think this will be great for folks to just really let, let that sink in five years, guys, five years. So if you're not liking your labs right now, you're not liking how things are going. It is time to get some stuff done. And Amy and I are going to have everything in the podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com for you to get that help. Amy, remind folks where they can find you on Instagram and your website and all the details. Website, amykwilson.com, A-M-Y-K-W-I-L-S-O-N.com. And Instagram, The Nutrition Coach Pharmacist. It's The Nutrition Coach Pharmacist. And if you did not get my blueprint yet and you want my blueprint, what the blueprint is, is a lot, it's lots of recipes. Plus you get my special chili recipe too. Uh, it's message me either on my website or and Instagram. You can DM me, slide into my DMs, whatever it is. <laughs> Just slide on and slide in, <laughs> follow me, all that good stuff. And I will send you that blueprint so that you can have some great recipes that you can, you know, double, triple, whatever. And they make some really good, healthy recipes that you can take on the go or heat up later. Amazing. Amazing. The chili recipe is on my list of things to try this weekend, by the way. So I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Amy. I really appreciate you coming back on and chatting with us. So much fun. So good. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.